Hello and welcome back to Nature's a Hoot. I'm one of your hosts, Hannah, alongside Tom, who is also here with me. Hello. This is the Wildlife Podcast brought to you by the Hawk Conservancy Trust. We absolutely love the natural world and hopefully you do too. And if you don't, well, then we hope that we can do something to help change that. This week, our focus is on some of the most elusive creatures to call our British open fields and woodlands home. Birds that you're only likely to see in the wild if you're in the right place at the right time. And we are, of course, talking about the owls, a group of species that has captured our collective imagination for thousands of years and now need our help to survive in the wild. And as the Hawk Conservancy Trust, we make it our job to offer that help. So we're going to try and tell you about the owl species that we find here in the UK, where you might spot them, and the work that we do at the Trust to support the native populations. So firstly, which species do we have here in the UK, Hannah? We have five species uh, in the UK, or five main species, and those are the tawny owl, barn owl, little owl, the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl. So five native species of owls that, if you're really lucky, you could see out and about in the British countryside today. Big question, Hannah. Have you seen all five native species of owls? I haven't seen all five. No, not me. I haven't seen a long-eared owl, but I have seen the other four. That's definitely the one I'm missing as well. Um, I don't know, I know at certain points of the year they kind of communally nest, or at least communally roost. And so I feel like it's a bit sort of boom or bust. You're either going to see lots of long-eared owls in one go, just simply because there's loads there in, in at one time, um, or they're going to be really elusive. They're so well camouflaged, aren't they, the, the long-eared owls? Well, I think I would argue that most species of owl are pretty well camouflaged. That's kind of their thing, isn't it? It's kind of <laughs> yeah. all stealth hunting, hiding wherever you possibly can, taking your prey by surprise, and, of course, keeping yourself well hidden from those other larger predators as well. I think probably the first owl I ever saw was a barn owl. That's probably true for lots of people, isn't it? It's the first owl they see. I think maybe, because barn owls are maybe the easiest, if you if you can say that uh, an owl is easy to see, which obviously most owls are pretty tricky to find, um, I think probably most people would have seen a barn owl just because that flash of white is a little bit more distinctive. Yeah, it's so striking, isn't it? Just to, it stands yeah. out. And also it tends to be at the right time of day. So a, a barn owl's a crepuscular species, we tend to say, meaning they're most active at kind of dusk and dawn. And especially during the kind of autumn months or in the early part of the spring, it tends to coincide to the time that you're just leaving for work or you're heading home for the evening. And uh, if you drive along country lanes, pretty much where anywhere across the UK, there's a quite a high chance... Uh, that you might see a barn owl at some point gliding along the car next to you or even flying over over the road itself it's it's quite mesmerizing when you spot them i did actually see a barn owl last night did you on our way home so we went out uh for dinner and yeah on the way home just flash um just fly as you said exactly as you said just fly up off a branch and just in front of the car and then into the field no way i mean i've i've found it's lovely quite often birds of prey especially owls it, they don't tend to clock you straight away. So I've been driving along quite late at night. So there's no other cars around on the road. And I remember seeing a barn owl sat on um, like an AA sign that had been put out on some roadworks on the side of the road. Yeah. The roadworks had kind of long gone and they'd left the sign out. And I actually kind of pulled over on the side of the road and just sat there and watched it. And it was it was looking, probably listening as well, into the undergrowth um, down in the hedgerow. And I must have sat there for a good two or three minutes before it went oh my goodness, somebody's watching me, and then kind of did that beautiful <laughs> sort of floaty flight back over the hedgerow and, and yeah. off into the darkness. Um, they're just, it, what a privilege to be able to see. They do have a really nice flight style, really lovely to watch. Now, I think it's often said that uh, if you're going to hear an owl, though, it's often a tawny owl. So if you're going to see one, the barn owl, striking white, right time of day, all those things all club together to mean that seeing a barn owl is in many ways much easier than seeing the tawny owl. On the flip side to that, I hear tawny owls, I don't know about you, I hear tawny owls on the regular, especially in the spring and the autumn. Um, They seem to be really vocal, really noisy. Yeah, I think even in urban areas, I live in in a fairly urban area in Andover, and at night time I have heard tawny owls 
from my house and you would never think you know where are they I mean there's a few there's trees around the development but um yeah they're definitely I think the owl that you're most likely to hear at night and of course they've got that typical twit to woo sound which everybody associates with owls and they're actually the only species that does make that sound yeah and that's it's that twit to woo call and um in fact two owls talking to each other so you've got one owl going to it another owl going to woo, and it's like a call and response so Often, if I've been hearing tawny owls, I could be stood in one position. You get twit from your left and to woo from your right, and they're like kind of talking, um, talking across you. Yeah, it's pretty cool to be stood in the middle of that in the middle of the dark. Whereas, kind of conversely, the barn owl doesn't have quite so much of a. Well, it certainly has a recognisable call, but it's not quite so quaint and lovely. It's a much more fearsome sound, isn't well, it? Well, it's a screech, isn't it? It's quite eerie and can be quite sort of unsettling almost very haunting call and you can imagine how way back when in our history you know these days we absolutely love barn owls but maybe once upon a time you know back when people were much more superstitious about just about everything um, a barn owl giving that blood curdling screech in the graveyard you lived opposite was just that kind of classic ghost story really So the tawny owl is our largest species, uh, barn owl just a little bit smaller. Right down at the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got the incredibly inventively named species, <laughs> the little owl, which is our <laughs> smallest native species. Um, I know at the Trust we have just a couple of these, I think, floating around some of the neighbouring fields. But I'm, I must admit, I haven't seen a little owl for, well, I haven't seen a little owl for a little while. I think that, that might be the owl that I've seen the most. Because there used to be a pair that lived opposite at my old house and they lived in a barn opposite and they would often come out, again, sort of more crepuscular, so come out just before sunset or sometimes early in the morning and would just see them sitting on the on the side of the barn, which is lovely to see. I really like little owls. I think they get a little bit of a bad rap because they're not... I don't know if they've actually got native species... Um, if they've been classified as a native species because they obviously were reintroduced, but it was so many years ago now. I think a lot of people wouldn't realise that a little owl has not just always been here because they're so much part of the furniture now, aren't they? You know, a little owl, you know, they are quite an iconic British species, I guess, but it, it really wasn't that long ago that little owls weren't a weren't a species that you'd find here in the UK. Um, you know, it's only kind of towards the end of the 19th century that they were kind of brought across here from mainland Europe um, on ships, I think. I think part of the reason was, or a couple of the reasons I've heard at least, is that they would help to catch insects in people's kitchens. So they like to have insects around the home, um, or rather they'd like to have the little owls around the home to catch those insects. Um, They're quite... A beneficial little bird because they as you said they eat a lot of insects and they would actually eat a lot of insect pests so they'd actually be beneficial for farmers and landowners now we we touching on this kind of um introduced species thing i've also heard conflicting things about whether a european eagle owl is also a native species and uh, i wonder what your thoughts about that were um I wouldn't consider them a native species, but I mean, it's not up to me, obviously. But uh, it would be a I much better world are... if it was up to you, Hannah. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there are small populations that have established themselves, and whether that be from escaped birds or um, birds that people have purposefully um, introduced, I don't think. I'm not sure if there's any populations that have actually established themselves by flying from the mainland do you know that well i think this is part of the problem it's not really knowing their origin whether they've been released accidentally released on purpose and we've seen this with other animals especially large animals that um have kind of been hard to keep historically you know people have them when they're very small and then they go oh my goodness this is a really tricky animal to look after and they think oh nobody will know and, and then yeah. release them so they could have come from that 
I mean, they're big birds, so I, I mean, to me, I wouldn't completely rule it out them no. actually flying across from from mainland Europe. But um, it seems a little out of character for yeah. for an, an eagle owl. Having worked with you know the captive birds at the trust and okay. um, um, over the years, they tend to be um, I don't know, they tend to be kind of creatures of habit, really. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'd kind of be with you, really. They're, they're probably birds that have accidentally been been let go and escaped, and they've managed to to survive and that doesn't yeah. surprise me at all i mean we do know that snowy owls um occasionally most years i think get blown over from scandinavia so perhaps there could be eagle owls that have also been blown over from europe yeah of course well, i mean those those snowy owls I, I think we were kind of expecting them to be right up in the far north aren't yeah. we of the uk so not really in england no. but um right up in the far northern reaches of scotland and i mean I, i'm pretty pretty certain that in the past we we have had them breed here in the uk but not for many many years now um again what what a bird to be able to see back on british british soil once again they're and again totally different from other species of owls they're they're not these perch and pounce hunters they're big big powerful muscular wings and they're actually taking off and flying around i think they're as close to the rest of the bird of prey world as any other any other owl. Yeah, so those they seem to have gone more along that adaptation of being a true, true hunter where they actually go and yeah, target prey rather than the sit and wait technique of most of our British owls. So I feel like we're getting sidetracked just a little bit from our five definite native species, all bar the little owl, which is a little question mark above it, but um so the the short eared owl, I have seen one short eared owl in my years and it was complete fluke, didn't go looking, just happened to turn a corner around a hedge and there was this short eared owl flying in this floaty way that they do. Um and I I wouldn't be ashamed to say they're probably the owl I know the least about. I think the same for me, short eared owl and long eared owl in fact, probably know the least about and I should think that comes just because I haven't really seen either of them well I've seen shorted our once but um yeah it was up in Scotland similar to what you said we did actually go looking for them because we knew that they were in that air particular area but as you said the same sort of floaty flight style um but yeah as they're not some something that I see very often but they are also a migratory species so I know that in the winter we get more birds come across from uh from Iceland and Scandinavia um, so maybe it's the winter time that's going to give us the best opportunity to see it. And that's what you and I should both do. We should set ourselves the challenge that over this winter, at some point, we're going to see a, a short-eared owl again. <laughs> and maybe a long-eared owl. We need to add the long-eared owl to the list. We do. We do. Now, I'm called a long-eared owl largely because of these long ears and it doesn't really work on this format but I am using the quotation marks of my fingers here these long ears <laughs> because we call them ears and they're absolutely nothing to do with their ears or their hearing whatsoever are they no not ears at all not really that near to their ears either no so they're, they're literally feathers that stick up on the top of their head um, mostly for display purposes partly for camouflage purposes as well it's thought their ears for any of these owl species that we've been talking about are located either side of their head um, for each species in slightly different places but often asymmetrically placed so meaning one ear is slightly higher than the other yeah. um, slightly offset and it's thought that this changes the time for which it takes the sound to reach the owl's ear from wherever it originates and what we mean by that is that essentially one ear will get the sound a fraction of a second before the other ear and this helps the bird to locate their prey. Now for some species that might be very useful under um, a, a thick layer of leaves on the forest floor. Um, for something like the great grey owl, this always comes up in, in documentary series on television, the great grey owl hunts in some of the coldest regions of the world where for many months of the year the ground is covered in a thick layer of snow and a permafrost and the great grey owls have this well it's just mesmerizing facial disc it's the largest facial disc of any species of owl 
much bigger comparatively than the barn owl's facial disc, although it is there. And they use this to kind of gather the sound. And that sound is then pushed into either ear, one slightly before the other, and it's kind of like... I always think of it as like X and Y coordinates to exactly where their prey is. It's almost like, oh, yeah. you know, they hear it once, they hear it That's twice. A nice analogy. There it is. And they can actually pounce down on prey without ever having seen it fairly successfully. So we can safely say a long eared owl does not have its ears sticking up on the top of its head. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> now, the long eared owls also a migratory species, I think. Are they uh, migratory within within the country? Is that right? Are they more of a sort of... I think so, um, yeah. yeah. yeah Maybe like a bit a like a Merlin. Because the Merlins will move up and down the country throughout the year as well, won't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've often referred to them, and I've heard other people refer to it, so this is not just something I've made up, um, as the, the squeaky gate owl. <laughs> and they're the squeaky gate owl because of the... Especially their juvenile call sounds like somebody has left a gate ajar and it sounds like they're kind of hinging in and out. <laughs> is that the juvenile call? is more like a squeaky gate or is that actually that's the, the adult call no that's the juvenile so they they okay. it's like that begging call to mum and dad yeah. that contact call to keep yeah. in touch with their parents and I th- i'm pretty sure that goes over time and then they they go across to their to their normal call So that hopefully gives you an idea of all of our native species of owls here in Britain. And Hannah, we've got projects specifically set up at the Hawk Conservancy Trust, haven't we, to support some of those native species of owls? Yes, we do. So um, the main project that we have working with owls is our raptor nest box project. And the purpose of this project is to provide nesting opportunities for um, cavity nesting species so it also includes kestrels and then the owls that we're focusing on are the little owl barn owl and tawny owl and we provide nest boxes for all those species across southern England um, and we have all together we have almost a uh, more than a thousand nest boxes now um, and about 750 of those are owl nest boxes so we started this project in 2008 um, with just 38 nest boxes, I think. So it's obviously gotten a lot bigger over the last 12 years or so. Um, do we know how successful putting up nest boxes can be? Like how how many of them are kind of actually used and occupied? Um, it's difficult to say how successful they are in terms of whether it sort of increases the population or not. Um, but yeah, we can definitely look at numbers of how inhab- how many are inhabited and um, how many are used in terms of how many we put up compared to how many are used. Um, so with the owls, we have about, f- of the 750, about 580 of those are actually available for owls to use. And the reason that other ones aren't available might just be because they're old and falling apart and they need replacing or they might be being used by a different species for instance jackdaws like to use owl boxes um ducks sometimes use them that's one brave duck isn't it i know <laughs> i actually saw one uh tawny owl box that had fallen out of a tree uh when i went out with matt once so it it was very old box and he was going to replace it and it had had a um duck nest in it and this box was up a massive tree it was like 30 feet up a tree and for all intents and purposes it looked like the ducks had been completely successful but those ducklings would have had to jump out of a nest box 30 feet off off the ground that's amazing (laughs) yeah so quite nice stories from uh, uh, interesting stories sometimes of mixed species using the nest boxes Um, But just to go back to the point, so about 580 available um, and then most of those are barn owl boxes. So around 400 are barn owl boxes, around 70 are tawny owls and we only have a few little owl boxes. Um, And those are the three species of owls that we're looking after with this particular project at the moment. Barn owls, tawny owls, little owls. um, Exactly. Is is there a reason that we we focus on those birds mainly? 
Um, I think, well, we focus on those birds because they're cavity nesting species. Um, tawny owls are amber listed. Um, and also they're, I mean, there's, I say they're amber listed, but those three species are also common in southern England. So mm. they're ones that we are focusing on at the moment. And by cavity nester, we mean anything that kind of lives inside something rather than in a in a conventional nest. Exactly. Um, so the the long eared owl often take over old jackdaw nests, things like that, won't they? Whereas yeah. these are birds that will live maybe inside a tree hollow, or some of yeah. them will use um, buildings occasionally. Obviously, the barn owl, classic example, happy yeah. to use old derelict buildings. Yeah, exactly. So um, as you said, they nest inside something, whether that be in a barn or a building or in a hole in a tree. That's how we define the cavity nesting species. So obviously quite a few of these species are going to be going after similar types of prey. Is there ever conflict between these birds in terms of who ends up using the box successfully? I think there's definitely conflict sometimes. So there might be um, two species attempting to use the same box. But there's also successes. Um, In 2019, there were um, cases of barn owls sharing boxes with jackdaws and all successfully raising chicks. And then also actually one case of um, both kestrel, kestrels and barn owls sharing the same box and again um, successfully fledging chicks. So that's really interesting. And show, I think it shows, especially the kestrels and barn owls, that that must have been quite good habitat for them. There must have been enough food there for them to be able to all provision their chicks. Because mm, they're eating huge amounts of food, aren't they? If they've got youngsters, those birds yeah. are growing up really quickly. So from hatching to fully grown for something like a barn owl is like 10, 12 weeks, isn't it? So that growth rate is exceptionally fast. And so providing the fuel for that growth rate is is really hard work for mum and dad. So for a, a kestrel and a barn owl to essentially be eating more or less the same food from small insects to rodents, short tail field voles, mice, shrews, things like that, for them to coexist in that area, like you say, what fantastic habitat must have been in that, that location? Well, the kestrels are going to be out, the parents are out most of the day going backwards and forwards to the nest, provisioning the nest, and it would be the same for the barn owls during the night. So maybe that might be why they were able to um, then exist in the same box because they were hunting at different times. It might not have worked out so well had it been two nocturnal species or two diurnal species. So they were kind of doing shift work, really. Yeah, maybe they were doing shift work. <laughs> it's a timeshare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Hannah, if we're measuring kind of the success of these programs by the number of fledged birds do we have the data from last year to tell us how many of those birds fledged from each of the target species we do have some data on that so it's still being worked on so these numbers might are sort of um guesstimates at this point um but we think it's around 250 for barn owls so 250 young fledged in 2019 Um, that we know of but then based on an average of how many barn owls usually fledge from a nest and nest boxes that we weren't able to get to um, we think it's closer to 400 for barn owls Um, and then tawny owls um, around 40 and then little owls as I said we don't have quite so many little owl boxes um, and little owls just don't seem to tend to use the boxes as much as the other two species um, but we did have four fledge last year. So, I mean, still four is better than none. Yeah, four more than there would have been, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Now, of course, we hope that our nest boxes offer an opportunity for wild raptors to find a roosting site or a site to breed. But even with this helping hand, some individuals find themselves in dire situations, whether it be through injury, starvation, or even just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. To combat this, we have the National Bird of Prey Hospital on site at the Trust, which treats sick and injured birds of prey. We'd like to tell you a bit more about the wild owls that come into the hospital and how they're cared for until they can be released. And we thought, who better to tell you all about this side of our work than our hospital manager, Cedric Robert. 
So on a breezy afternoon just last week, I caught up with Cedric and started by asking him when it was he started as hospital manager. That was in 2016. 2016, yeah. It's very interesting. Um, the way we work is very different to work with um, or trust a bird or captive bred bird. So, uh, and also you have the chance to, uh, to work with uh, different species. Uh, very unusual species actually for us, like go soak, hobby sometimes. And uh, so it's, yeah, osprey. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Regarding the owls, it will be the tawny owl for sure. Uh, again, this year during spring, we had, I will say, all, over 40 tawny owls chicks who, who came to us. And, uh, and throughout the year, again, we get quite a lot of tawny owls. So many tawny owls than the barn owls. So why do we think that it would more likely be tawny owls coming in to see us than than any other species. I think during springtime, we are more, people are more lucky to to find um, a tawny owl chicks. And for instance, um, in less than uh, two months, we had um, about 35 tawny owl chicks who came to us. So s straight away, the, 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 the tawny owl numbers increase very, very uh, suddenly. With the barn owls, we get quite a few, but, but not as many. If someone were to bring, uh, say, a tawny owl they've found here, what would be the process that that bird would then go through whilst it's here at the Trust and the National Bird of Prey Hospital? If the tawny owl chicks uh, come to us, obviously we assess his health and, um, and, and then he will probably go to, to our vet make sure we didn't miss anything um, depending how old is he if he's still very young only three weeks old we have to hand feed the birds but then very quickly the bird managed to find his food which is good and, and the good thing is with them we can maybe put a few of them all together at the very beginning and uh, so they can be for maybe f three weeks indoors and and again maybe two two more months uh, outside and and then we release them uh, back to the wild uh, so we're talking f for the same bird to be maybe three months with us, uh, roughly. So when the baby tawny owls come in, I understand it's quite important to make sure that they remember that they're tawny owls and they don't think that they're human beings. Is that right? That's correct. Um, which is, again, with tawny owls, we are very lucky because we don't get only one tawny owl chick every year. We get we get quite a few. So we can put four or five all together and they, by doing this they learn they, they still you know they still know they, they're a tawny owl and not a human but we have to be still very careful so we don't show ourselves with food we try to minimize the contact as much as we can so if someone were to find uh, uh, a tawny owl or any other bird of prey what would be your advice to them if they were to find something they thought was injured or in a in a tricky spot i think the best thing to do would be to try to uh they or to call us actually, uh, they ring us, no matter if, if it's far f from the park, but at least we can give them a, an advice. And uh, most of the time it's to go to uh, their local vet or maybe a rescue center if they, there's one close to them. Uh, but sometimes they just need to, to, to have somebody on the phone who can help them. And, uh, and obviously, if they think they can bring the bird to us, that, that, that's great. Uh, but all depending of the species or depending uh, of the bird itself. And, uh, but just give us a quick call and I'm sure we can help them at the very beginning. So it's always a pleasure to speak to Cedric. I always think his passion and expertise for the birds that he cares for always shines through. He really does work so hard um, to make sure that we can rehabilitate as many birds as possible in the hospital. If you do fancy finding out a bit more about the National Bird of Prey Hospital, or maybe even feel inspired to donate towards our work, then you can do so by logging onto our website and going to the hospital page. And there's a donate button at the bottom of this page. It actually costs around an average of £317 per bird that comes through our hospital um, to rehabilitate and release each bird. Yeah, because it's not cheap to do all the stuff that we do with the birds in the hospital, and especially at this time when things are so uncertain, we want to try and make sure we give as many of those birds a second chance as we can. So any donations that are made are very, very gladly received.
So let's delve into one of our regular features here on Nature's A Hoot, our big story in conservation. This is the bit where we take a bit of time to delve a little deeper into a conservation project or piece of conservation news that's maybe caught our interest over the last few weeks. And this month is Tom's turn. So what have you got for us, Tom? Well, we call this section the big story, don't we? And, and what bigger story could we have asked for over the last few weeks than the confirmation of the re-established population of beavers on the River Otter being allowed to stay wild on that river? Um, this came over the last couple of weeks and I've been doing a bit of reading around the subject and I'm sure you have too, Hannah. Um, if anybody who hasn't kind of got a mental picture of what a beaver is, uh, a beaver is a large aquatic rodent and they're when we say large, they can weigh up to 30 kilograms in weight when fully grown. They're over a metre uh, from the top of their head to the tip of their tail uh, when, when they're fully adult. And essentially, they're well known for gnawing through large chunks of wood and creating large deep ponds when they dam up a river, reducing the flow in some section of the river and creating entire new ecosystems, entire new habitats for fish, fungi, waterfowl, water voles. Now, it's been a bit controversial, really, over the last few years as to whether these beavers should be here or shouldn't. It's a little bit like our eagle owl and little owl, a little bit of controversy, I guess. Um, but a population of beavers whose origin is unknown, and that's really important. We don't know whether these animals were deliberately released, whether they escaped, whether they just magically appeared out of the ground. We just don't know. But we know that, that population has been present on the River Otter since around 2008. But when later video evidence emerged uh, that the beavers had then given birth to their kits, their youngsters, um, in 2014... That's when the government initially planned to have them removed from the river. This was when the DWT, or the Devon Wildlife Trust, started to oppose their removal and began a five-year consultation process with the local community, that includes landowners and public bodies, to present an alternative plan and to turn the situation into a five-year trial just to kind of monitor the beavers' effects and to kind of see what impact they had on the surrounding landscape, be that positive or negative. Now, as ecologists, conservationists, we want to make sure that a, a reintroduction of any species is positive and that the surrounding environment is taken into account when that begins. And uh, it's really nice to be able to say that just a couple of weeks ago, really, perhaps three weeks ago, um, that the re-established colony was allowed to remain in the area from the government, uh, which means that they are the first kind of legal wild breeding beavers in 400 years in England. So we said that these the population of beavers are being allowed to stay on the River Otter. I'm just wondering who might not want them to stay and what would be the reasons, what are the negative potential negative consequences of having beavers? Well, yeah, there could be cut some, couldn't they? Because by their very nature, they change the layout of the environment in which they live. They change directions of rivers and they create entire new areas for other wildlife to thrive. And so one of the big issues of changing the direction and flow of water is, of course, areas that might potentially be flooded. So areas of agricultural land w that might receive more of that water from the river um, that could have an impact on the yield of those fields. Um, of course, these are creatures that gnaw very quickly through some pretty large trees, and so that could potentially cause a hazard to public health. And in fact, during that five-year consultation period, I'm told that three trees fell on footpaths uh, over four <laughs> of those five years. So I think I think we can probably deal with, with three trees, can't yeah, we, in that time? Yeah, I think time? we can deal with three trees. <laughs> I imagine a bit of wind has probably blown over at least ten times that in that time. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so for the kind of positives that the beaver brings, I would say they outweigh the, the negatives on this. Yeah, and of course, I think there may have been some resistance to it because a lot of people maybe think that beavers eat fish. Yeah, that's true. A lot, a lot of people do think that. And, you know, if I'm entirely honest, when this story first came out, I thought, wow, this is a very big animal and they like to live in rivers. Well, surely, you know, they, they might have a little gnaw on the odd on the odd fish. Salmon. Yeah, on the odd, <laughs> on the odd salmon. And, uh, of course, they don't. They, they don't eat that at all. They're, um, they, they gnaw on 
little roots and stems and little aquatic plants. They're vegetarians. They're vegans. Yes, yeah, like me. Yeah, like you. <laughs> um, so they, they're not going to cause that kind of damage to, to fishing stocks. Um so they've not really been around for the last 500 years. Originally and historically, they were hunted for their fur and their meat and rather bizarrely for their their gland secretions used in some types of perfume, um, which right. you can keep that to yourself, to be honest. Not interested <laughs> in that whatsoever. <laughs> um, so, Hannah, this is the first legally sanctioned reintroduction of an extinct native mammal in England. Do we know if this has happened with beavers anywhere else uh, in the UK, historically? Yes, so there are other beavers in the UK. There was a similar situation on the River Tay in Scotland, uh, where some beavers were discovered and no one really knew where they came from. And they've actually established into quite a sizeable population. Some of the counts are putting them at around 200 individuals. Um but again, they were an accident, either an accidental reintroduction or not, but they, we don't really know where they came from. There has been an official um, legal licensed reintroduction of another population of beavers um, in Argyll in Scotland, um, in a place called Knapdale. And they are a similar situation to the River Otter, where they're now being monitored and um, those are actually allowed to, allowed to stay. Um, I think there's some conflict with landowners and farmers um, with the other population on the River Tay. Um, I mean, they're a large population of rodent. I'm sure they are making some difference to the landscape there. And then there is also a feasibility study happening at the moment in Wales. So we could potentially see beavers being reintroduced to Wales as well. I'm really excited. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of resisting a little bit just going to rush to the River Otter to go and see them because as much as we want this to boost local tourism yeah. for areas, when species get reintroduced, it's fantastic potentially for the local area to kind of capitalise on the fact that they're there and they almost become a symbol of that particular area, don't they? But yeah. also we want to do our best not to disturb a, a newly re-established species. Now it's time for this month's top tip for helping wildlife where you live. Our tip is to be kind to the biodiversity in your garden and use natural pest deterrents. The chemicals in weed killer and slug pellets can be fatal to wildlife such as hedgehogs, not to mention your beloved pets. Pesticides have a major effect on biodiversity and according to the State of Nature report 2019, 63% of priority species are in decline. Instead, why not try garlic or hot pepper spray for the pests in your veg patch, soapy water for green fly, eggshell or copper wire to deter slugs and snails, or even try attracting predators like hedgehogs, birds and toads to gobble them up. A very fascinating top tip for us again there, Hannah. Now, I last time mentioned about putting water in the garden. I think since then you've taken us up on that top tip yourself, haven't you? I certainly have. So I have actually gone the whole hog and I've dug myself a nice little wildlife pond, which I'm really pleased with. Um, it looks really nice. I've done a nice pebble beach so that if anything falls in, it can climb back out. Um, added some plants I haven't seen any frogs yet or toads yet, but I am out there every day in the hope that one will turn up soon. I have to say, Hannah, I've got a little bit of pond envy, to be honest, because <laughs> it, it is bigger than mine and better than mine in almost every way. But I'm I'm holding on to that little golden ticket of having a frog coming by. Yeah, um, you still have the frog. And you can see a photograph of Hannah's new wildlife pond on our blog that accompanies this episode. Now, coming up in the next few days, we have got 
one of our annual events at the Trust. It's called IVAD, International Vulture Awareness Day, which will be celebrated right around the world. And we'll be doing a few extra special things at the Trust to celebrate as well. Yes, so International Vulture Awareness Day is all about vultures and celebrating them. And we love vultures at the Hawk Conservancy Trust. Being the most threatened group of birds in the world, we think it's really important to raise awareness about their plight and um, inform on their conservation, which we do every day. Uh, But this will be just a little bit more extra special vulture awareness. Yeah, and do keep an eye on our social media pages as well during International Vulture Awareness Day and in the run-up. And uh, do share with us any pictures or experiences that you've had alongside vultures, be that here with us at the Hawk Conservancy Trust or whether you've seen them out in the wild. And we'd love to see some of your photographs if you have. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed coming along with us to find out a bit more about the wonderful world of British owls and the work we're doing to help conserve them in the wild. Remember to click and subscribe to this podcast through your podcast platform so that you don't ever miss an episode. Just like next month when we'll be talking all about young people in conservation and how important education can be to inspire that next generation, including Indy Green, who will be our guest on the podcast next month. Uh, He is a young wildlife photographer, naturalist and conservationist. Remember, you can always find out more by following us on social media. We are at Hawk Conservancy on all those platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Once again, thanks for listening and we'll be back on the 1st of October. Bye. Bye. Bye.